So, hello everybody here in Berlin at Säschen on the Holzmarkt Areal and at home or wherever you are watching on Alex TV here in Berlin on the respective websites of our partnering institutions to another edition of Making Sense of the Digital Society. Running, having run for so long, and I'm really glad so many people actually could make it out to this venue here on site in Berlin. It's uh, such a good site after all those years, and we know that um, some of those events have trouble finding their audience. We apparently do not have that problem really, so uh, that's really quite glad it turned out that way. Um, as you probably know, this is an event that uh, is mounted by two different agencies. It's the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society on one hand, and also the Federal Agency for Civic Education that is responsible for this series. Uh, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to the subject uh, and, of course, to our guest speaker uh, tonight. Then there's going to be a talk of about 45 minutes. We'll start with a one-to-one -one conversation here on stage for about 10 or 15 minutes, see how this goes. And, of course, you at home, you have the opportunity of asking questions with a participatory tool called Slide. Uh, and of course here in the Saal on site too, there's a microphone going around if you have questions there. So we're going to open up in due time and uh, listen what you have to say or what you have to ask. This is the third session this year, actually the fourth session just as a small outlook is going to place. The first edition is not going to, uh, not going to be uh, taking place in Berlin but in Frankfurt uh, within the frame of uh, a theater festival actually, um, Politik im Freien Theater on the 6th of October. Stefania Milan is going to be with us and she's going to talk about resistance in the datified society. But let me tune in into the subject in a, on a more of a cultural note, not just out of a mere whim, because I like those subjects, because I think we're going to talk a lot about cultural factors too uh, when we talk about war and warfare. Well, let me start with a song. Uh, I'm not going to sing it, don't be afraid. Let me start with a song you probably all know, War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. It's a song from the famous soul label from Detroit Motown in Detroit. The Temptations actually recorded it in 1969, but the label was afraid to promote an anti-Vietnam song to the rather conservative fan base of The Temptations and gave it to a less polished artist, uh, Edwin Starr, who took it to number one right away in the US and other countries. Allow me to tune in on a pop cultural note here because you probably know the quote according to famous German media philosopher Friedrich Kittler, um, rock music is the misuse of military equipment. He himself actually was quoting um, a German general of World War I that uh, didn't, want to, didn't want his troops to listen to radio broadcasts that were uh, being invented at the time, not until 1920 when Germany actually um, established a state radio, but there were certain technicians on the front lines that uh, uh, did radio broadcasting for both sides, for the French and the Germans actually. But back to the song, War, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. What a line. What an ambivalent line too, because most people probably agree that war is not very pleasant, but there's a second meaning looming here, absolutely nothing signifies not only an ethical judgment, like war is bad, but marks the dark political objective of war that can be nothingness as a metaphor for total destruction, high number of casualties, nothingness as the abyss. I'm quoting this song because I'm not sure it still would work today, actually. First of all, because pop music lost its social thrust to technology. Who needs slogans in music when social media are way more effective in organizing protest? The second reason why we do not hear a lot of protest music against war probably has to do with the popular conceptions of warfare many of us have today. And this is getting closer to what we're going to hear tonight by our guests. The Vietnam War was the first, at least in parts, televised war that communicated the images of death to any TV set near you. What one in Germany we often call the second Gulf War, the first of course uh, having been the Iran-Iraq War, or Operation Desert Storm, it was just only one uh, part of this war actually, 
um, somehow initiated a shift of popular imagery. Radar images from within fighter planes guided missiles with precise engines, so we were told. A seemingly easy ground invasion of Kuwait after the clean air battle by the coalition led by the United States. There are many computer games that are staged around the Second Gulf War, actually. Um, probably for this very reason, that technology changed war completely, or so many believed. But what kind of war is this now, reaching so close to home? The closer the conflict, or war, let's call it war, the fuzzier our knowledge about its technology, or rather the various technologies involved. Regular, irregular, hybrid, cyber, conventional, and so forth. Tonight's lecture will shed some light right here. Not only when it comes to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but generally to our shifting notions of warfare, what warfare actually is, has become, was, and so forth. So our guest tonight, he was a soldier in the Canadian Army, as he just told me before uh, uh, his lecture. He studied then uh, in Glasgow and is now teaching at King's College in London. He's coming all the way from London to our um, series is Professor of War in the Modern World, it's called, at King's College. He's written widely on the effect of information technology on war and warfare in recent times. Many of these ideas you can find in his 2017 book, Carnage and Connectivity, landmarks in the decline of conventional military power. His main interest at present is in the astonishing size, range, and design ingenuity of contemporary fortifications. These reflections will be published next year in his upcoming book, The Guarded Age. In his lecture titled, War in the Digital Age, he will also give us a deeper glimpse into the theory of his discipline, its history, before leading us to the present in order to discuss current events, of course. And I'm quite optimistic that we will see the present war in a different light after his lecture. However, this is about all the optimism I can muster recording this war right now. When we had a video call in preparation for tonight, a guest told me to beware of a rather gloomy outlook he was going to present at the end in order to stress the importance of the outcome of the Russo-Ukrainian war. If this is a defining moment for our future, we better have a good grip on what this war actually materially is and what it is much less or not at all. Very pleased he's here to talk to and with us. Please welcome David J. Betts. Thank you for your, uh, your um, introduction, it was very kind, and for the, in and for the uh, invitation to be here, which was uh, very flattering. I used to think that war was good for lots of things, uh, and I've changed my mind over, over time. As you get older and you study a thing for a long time, I'm not so sure it really is good for uh, much at all. But it does exist, and it remains uh, very interesting. Or, I, and I think, I mean, it must obviously be interesting because there are a lot of people uh, in the room. And I think it's important for us to figure, figure out or to understand as well uh, uh, as we're able for uh, obvious reasons. I'm going to talk mostly about, uh, I'm mostly going to focus on society, uh, and mo much, much more so on society than on the technology of weapons and the like. If people want to talk about guns and missiles and weapon systems and the like, I'm very happy to indulge in, 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 uh, the, in the discussion which, uh, with, which follows. So what you'll hear is about, about a third is uh, theory of warfare, essentially. A third is going to be on, on history, and a third is going to be on, con on the contemporary scene uh, for what it's worth, how I see it. At the end of the opening scene of Stanley Kubrick's uh, film 2001 A Space Odyssey, there's a two-minute sequence that is uh, set to the music of uh, Richard Strauss, uh, Strauss's also Sprach Zarathustra, in which you see two groups of pre-humans in a battle. And at the end of it, uh, one of our distant hominid ancestors, having just smashed in the skull of his enemy, with an animal thigh bone, triumphantly hurls this uh, newfound weapon up into the air where through the magic of cin cinema it transforms into an orbiting spaceship. Many of you will have seen uh, and recognized uh, this scene. It's a, I think that that is a masterpiece of grand historical narrative, completely without words. 
I think it says a few things about war and about humans that are quite useful as a starting point for this uh, lecture. Basically, war goes back a long way. As long as we can see in history, war is there. We can presume it's uh, there in, in prehistory also. Secondly, in its nature, war doesn't change very much. It was, it's still fundamentally about, it, it is still fundamentally in, instrumental violence. Uh, it's still essentially about skull breaking. Thirdly, the ways and means of war, the way in which, which is what we mean by the word warfare, the conduct of war, that of course changes constantly as we go through, as we go through history. Warfare at any given time in history is, is shaped by the dominant societal assemblage in all of its intertwined aspects. There are cultural, political, economic, and technological drivers uh, for that. I put technological at the end because, frankly, I think that the technological is probably the least, the least of it, or it's not the most important as it is uh, often assumed to be. So, in this lecture, I want to focus on warfare as uh, the dependent variable. And my main premise is that warfare changes constantly, like a chameleon, because of larger societal changes. When it comes down to it, humans are simply very imaginative at fighting. We're relentless and ingenious at exploiting every possible way of killing our enemies and breaking their things, causing pain, essentially. 10,000 years ago, we hurled rocks at each other because that was that because in, that was the extent of the combat potential that existed in a Neolithic society. Now we throw rockets at each other because the technological wherewithal of modern society is so much, is so much uh, greater. Now, it is widely supposed also that in the last generation or two, depending on where you start it, ours has become a postmodern information society, or digital society, if, if you will. There are w various ways of naming it. And if that is the case, then what should we should ask are the paradigm paradigmatic weapons and techniques of warfare uh, coming into being now. That's what I'm going to try to talk about. And I really have three main points. I'll give you the bottom line up front. The first is that at the level of a whole societal confrontation, confrontation the character of information age warfare is dominated by the weaponization of ideas, something which, at which the West is at a surprising disadvantage because of the critical tunneling out of its myth power over the last generation or two, the tunneling out of its cultural myths. Secondly, at the level of physical combat, there's a surprising shift away from maneuver warfare towards a much more positional form of warfare that I would describe as network-enabled attrition, something of which, again, the West is at a significant disadvantage at this time because of long-standing industrial and defense policy decisions, which have re resulted in the, uh, in the dra drastic thinning and lightening of our armed forces. Thirdly, given that the post-1945 liberal international order, as it is called, is based upon dynamics that, that reflected the high point of the industrial age, a phase from which the West, at any rate, is supposed to be departing, we should anticipate, therefore, that the alteration of that societal form will also reorder world affairs profoundly. The, the processes that are contributing to these things are decades old, but the recent and ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine has brought them into focus quite sharply. Before getting into details, of, uh, however, I want to dwell for a few moments on definition. Firstly, uh, war. War and warfare. War is the organized use of violence by one organized group against another for some political objective. It has several natural, we might call them, attributes that, attributes that exist no matter what era in history or place in the world that we observe it. These are, firstly, that it involves the causing of pain and destroy, destruction of value. That is what distingu di distinguishes war from normal political commerce. 
Secondly, war is reciprocal. We don't make war on inanimate entities. Despite the fact you may have heard the phrase war on drugs, war on poverty, those things are not wars because they are not reciprocal. The drugs are not fighting back, whereas we, when, we make, when we make war, we make war on another living thinking entity which is imaginative and which wants to win as badly as we do. Thirdly, war is chancy. It is intrinsically chancy. The outcome of any given action in war is never completely predictable. This is vital, vital to understand, and I think an important point, particularly uh, with this audience or in this subject area, where there are frequent claims that technology is going to eliminate that area, er, area of unpredictability and chance in war. It, that it will lift the fog of war, as it is called. Uh, in my view, this will not happen. It cannot happen without cha a change in the nature of warfare that I very much uh, suspect is not going to happen while human beings are, uh, uh, while war is a, a human thing. Warfare, by contrast, is the conduct of war, which in practice varies enormously. New techniques for applying force are constantly invented. We create new weapons. We also are very, uh, are very creative at finding, new way of finding ways of weaponizing things which are not weapons in themselves. Okay? Human inventiveness, particularly in non-military fields, often has a bigger impact on warfare than the improvement of old weapons or the creation of new weapons. For example, the railroad. Railroad revolutionized military lo logistics. The railroad is probably one of the big reasons for the existence of Germany today, because the railroad led to the, the, the um, German success in the Franco-Prussian Prussian, uh, Franco War. Telecommunications. Telecommunication, telecoms are the central requirement of mobile combined arms operations. There would have been no blitzkrieg without radios. Okay? Uh, without medicine especially disease control um, or food preservation technology, you couldn't run an army around uh, year-round campaigning. It would just be uh, in impossible, certain areas that you simply couldn't operate in. You couldn't put large numbers of people together in, in, uh, without them suffering from disease without m modern medicine. For that matter, even without, uh, even without even more abstract technologies, like central banking, or double account bookkeeping, uh, big armies could not be paid. Uh, so for example, an important reason that Britain prevailed over Napoleon in the Napoleonic Wars was that Britain was fundamentally very, very good at raising money, uh, right? To pay for ships, to pay for continental allies, and so on. So we should not be surprised, therefore, that big claims are made about the impact of digital technology on warfare because the fact that it is a civil technology uh, does, isn't very meaningful. It doesn't mean that it cannot have a direct and large impact on warfare. Okay. So, war is, war is more than just spasmodic violence because it has a political object. And warfare is more than just a bar brawl because ultimately it can employ the full potentiality of violence that it exists within a given society. A good rule of thumb for understanding the way in which societies make war uh, is to say that societies make war in the same way they make wealth, right? So whatever, in, in this case, the war, think of the wars of agrarian societies tend to have distinctively rural qualities to them. The campaigns conform with the growing season because you can't take men out of the fields or, or there's a very great cost to a society of taking men out of the fields during harvest, for example. Uh, weapons tend to re resemble agricultural instruments, you know, is it pointy or sharp things on the end of long poles. Uh, there's a heavy use of animals, same sort of animals you would encounter on a farm. The rank structure of, of agricultural armies tends to reflect the, the, the rank structure of the parent society with peasants as soldiers and nobles as officers. Likewise, the wars of industrial societies reflect the strengths and preoccupations of factory managers and uh, state technocrats. What are they interested in? Standardization. Standardization of things like weapons, mechanization, mass mobilization, and generally speaking, the rational application of science to military problems. 
what we might then call uh, the character of warfare is especially notice, noticeable at the beginning at the en or, and at the end of any given age when societies that are participating in one form of warfare, agrarian, say, uh, come into conflict with uh, societies that are participating in another. In those kind of sort of cases, you have a kind of laboratory test uh, of that in which you can compare the warfighting effectiveness of the new ways and means as against the old version. And gener generally, that's when we know something big has happened in warfare because we get a war where there's a very lopsided outcome. For a good mental image of this picture, uh, I would ask you to consider the 1877 Battle of Shiroyama in Japan. If this is completely news to you, maybe you're familiar with the Tom Cruise film, uh, which portrayed uh, the, the battle. But it is popularly known as the last stand of the samurai, in which a small band of superb swordsmen of the old regime, a quintessentially agrarian system, each resplendent in their uh, armor and their individualized military regalia, faced off against a superior mass of very blandly uniformed riflemen of the new imperial Japanese army. Uh, short story, the, the samurai are wiped out. All right. um, the Industrial Revolution clearly transformed society. I don't think this needs much further expl explication uh, than that. And it, it similarly transforms uh, warfare. Uh, it's really impossible to, to do justice to that transformation in a paragraph or two. So what I want to do is just focus on three things that I think are pertinent to understanding where we are now, which I, which I will get to in a bit. Firstly, the first factor I would say is that the patterns of whatever the old paradigm were are not fully erased or replaced by those of the new one. Instead, there seems to emerge a kind of blend of the two in which sometimes the importance of old things re-emerges in ways that can be quite shocking. This is particularly the case in customs and art. We're very familiar with this. Again, for example, to stick with Japan for a moment, contemporary Japan is an undeniab undeniably a modern, uh, a, a, a modern high-tech country. Yet, you can find samurais everywhere. Right? You go into any, every neighborhood and you'll find a samurai school or a kendo school where they're teaching people in the traditions of Japanese swordsmanship. Go to any country festival in any small town and you'll, have, you'll see people practicing horse archery or all kinds of archaic, uh, archaic skills that people have kept. It's just in human nature and very admirable in my view that people hold on to things long past the point that they had any superior functionality or possibly any functionality just because they like them. Um, it's also true of physical things to an extent. So to illustrate that, I would ask you to consider that the industrial model of war, which experts tend to call the modern system, was invented on the battlefields of the First World War. And it was designed to solve the problem of trench warfare. And essentially it refers to the integration of, of infantry, armor, artillery, and air power, plus supporting arms uh, in combined operations. In the popular concept, in the popular consciousness, this, is, this development in warfare is often revolves around the image of horses and tanks, sometimes just horses. Right? You may be familiar with the Michael Morpurgo novel turned into a film, uh, War Horse, right? So this, uh, First World War and horses really is an idea that goes together in people's minds. And it's pretty obvious why. Horses are extremely vulnerable to bullets and shrapnel, and horses are also, we, we like horses. I mean, a human being who doesn't like a horse is a very suspicious figure in my point, uh, from my point of view. Tanks basically are immune to bullets and, uh, and shrapnel. Therefore, from the perspective of 1918, from the, from the perspective of the invention of modern warfare, what do we know about the future of war, warfare? No horses. Except when you look at the details, you realize things like the, the British Imperial Camel Corps, okay, not horses, but four-legged creatures uh, that you ride on, was very, was very important for the policing of, of, uh, of vast tracts of British Africa all the way through the interwar period. The same uh, British Imperial Camel Corps played a very useful role in the Abyssinian campaign of 1940-41. The German army of the Second World War 
often argued, be, argued to be the army that first perfected mobile operations. Its logistics system was based on uh, wagons and horses right through to the end of the war, right through to 1945. The Soviet army deployed dozens of cavalry divisions uh, throughout the war, and late in it even organized core-sized cavalry form formations, so big cavalry units. Bottom line is that horses were very useful on the Eastern Front for lots of reasons, which is why Germany recruited uh, two, Cossack, two Ukrainian Cossack divisions uh, during, uh, during the Second World War, which were used extensively in counter-partisan counter warfare. Even today, the United States Marine Corps keeps a, a school running in a, in a mountainous part of California where soldiers are trained to pack horses and organize mule trains. I could give lots more examples of continuity as opposed to revolution in military affairs, but the point is that old things don't, do not completely disappear. Right? They, tend, they may get attenuated, they get, get mutated, but, uh, but, they, but, these, but they, uh, they, they, they don't disappear uh, completely. Again, for a mental image of this that is pretty accessible to people who enjoy uh, film or literature, picture the air cavalryman or the Air Cavalry Commander in the Vietnam War film uh, Apocalypse Now, right? He's wearing a cavalryman's uh, uh, hat um, while he's charging into battle on a helicopter while listening to Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries. Fundamentally, things are not black and white, rather gray. They're never completely monocausal uh, or one directional, but sometimes they're a bit forwards and a bit backwards all at the same time. Second main point is that although we have quite, a f quite few transitions of ages uh, to judge by, in this case I've just presented agrarian, industrial, and information as we get further, one of the things that we observe pretty obviously is that the pace of change is accelerating. The agrarian age lasted a very long time. It effectively is, lasts from the beginning of civilization, which is, uh, up to a couple of hundred years ago. The industrial age, by comparison, is you know, maybe 200 years. It's a blip in time. Moreover, the industrial era, era moved at a blinding pace, which frequently confounded and bewildered those involved in it. Again, uh, part of the re to go back to the First World War, part of the reason for the particularly horrific waste of lives in the first two years of the First World War was that the Napoleonic mindset of the, of the generalship, which was only a century old at that point, uh, was wholly ill-suited to the new potentialities of warfare. A lot of military historians would argue that there was as much military adaptation occurring in two years, 1916 through 1918, as there, had been, as there have been in all the years since the First World War. In that short period, armed forces learned to coherently integrate accurate long-range indirect fire, artillery, tanks, and other mechanized vehicles, battlefield electronic communications, fighter and bomber airplanes, so on and so forth, all while fighting in what then was the largest war in human history. The importance of this point, in my view, is that if you accept the concept of transition from one age to another age, from one paradigm to another paradigm, and you accept the idea that change is accelerating, then the logical conclusion is that we now are awaiting a moment of realization that everything we have been doing is now wrong and we must do something completely different, more or less immediately. <clears throat> Thirdly, change from one age to another seems to coincide with changes in the international order that are large and jarring. That's pretty obvious. Less obvious is that it's not always the earliest beneficiaries of the change which profit from it in the long run. For example, the Industrial Revolution powered the rise of the West, more specifically the European powers, in part because they were able to exercise military power in ways that the rest of the world simply could not match. But at the same time, it also led to the world wars that drastically weakened the European global powers and created two extra European superpowers in the form of the USA and the USSR. So we're coming close now to the present. And if I've dwelled a bit long on, on the past here, it's just that I think that's the best way, I think, to get towards some understanding of today's apparent 
paradoxes, if we may call them that. With respect to the last point uh, I raised, I believe the important thing to understand is that even great powers get blown away by the tides of history. It happened to the European empires, it happened to the USSR not so long ago, and I think it is happening to the, Amer to the American hegemony, which we call the liberal international order, right now. Um, it's a matter of debate when you, when you start the information age. Um, I think with this audience and in the interest of moving along in, in time, I won't dwell very long on, on this point. Uh, most of you will be familiar uh, with a lot of the literature to which I, I might refer. Suffice to say that uh, from my point of view, the information age didn't begin yesterday. It doesn't begin with the invention of the microchip. It doesn't, invent, it doesn't begin with the uh, incorporation of Google or, uh, or Amazon or, or, or what, ha what have you. It's somewhere further back in history. I am 53 years old and I would consider personally that I've never lived in a non-networked, uh, in a non-network, uh, uh, networked society, in a non-networked uh, age. Uh, and people have been, you know, scholars, uh, much, smart, much smarter than I am, have been writing about the dawning of the information age for at least a half century. In short, the information age has been around for a while, and so I think we can safely draw a few conclusions uh, about it. Sticking to the subject of warfare, we can clearly observe that equipped with modern military force, the European powers of the 19th century quickly conquered up and gobbled, or quickly conquered and gobbled up the territories of the extra European wars, governing other peoples, so it was argued, for their own good. Uh, for about 100 years, there was a comfortable alignment of two basic ideas. One, a belief that progress was served by European ideas governing everything, basically, and the military muscle to make that happen. Then the same powers turned on each other, mobilizing the whole industrial might of Western civilization into great uh, wars that ended up with most of this continent uh, raised and a good number of the old empires uh, wiped out. My point here is simply that coming first to a change in the potentiality of warfare is not necessarily an, in an indicator of success in the long term. More narrowly framing the discussion to recent technologies, we may ask more specifically, what happens to warfare when digital computing and high-speed, uh, high-density communications and microelectronics are applied to it? I think a starting point for the, to an answer to that question would be an understanding of the general context. To that end, it is said that the qualities of the information age are said to be something like the following that it has a character, that these characteristics, a high degree of intangibility of value in the larger economy. That is to say, if you've got knowledge industries, right, what are they doing? They are creating wealth, not by making things per se, but by creating ideas which may lead to products, to physical products, often made elsewhere. Or they may simply remain as ideas. They don't turn into physical products because they're perfectly saleable as ideas. Financial services, entertainment, so on. Secondly, there is a massive increase in the portability of information, uh, which practically everyone can now share in volumes and at speed and with a reach that would have astonished the most powerful governments just a generation ago. Uh, and a fact which is the main reason why it is now so difficult f to keep secrets. Uh, governments uh, really struggle with uh, keeping secret secrets, as does everybody, uh, frankly, because people are just so enthusiastic about sharing uh, their, their stuff. Thirdly, there's a dramatic leap in the scalability of certain types of in in inventions, particularly ideas, uh, the ad ideas no noted above, which can go from fringe to mainstream very, very quickly. Uh, right, we're all familiar with the concept of virality. That's essentially what I'm talking about. Changes in the military sphere <clears throat> have followed similar patterns and drawn on the same sorts of, of language. You, you may have heard this old syllogism that knowledge is power. Uh, that's a, a phrase credited originally to uh, Francis Bacon, but un undoubtedly a truism that 
human beings have always recognized. It seemed to be massively affirmed by digital technologies like advanced communications, satellite communication particularly, GPS navigation, very powerful sensors, and certain types of precision attack weapons. Uh, <clears throat> it's easy to see that for a general to be able to see his enemy's forces before they could see his, to know in real time the whereabouts of everything that was meaningful on the b battlefield, and to be able to strike accurately uh, would be a gigantic advantage, right? That would be like being uh, Zeus on Mount Olympus. You were practically guaranteed to win, uh, win that sort of uh, conflict. Ironically, the first military theorists to see this development coming were in the Soviet general staff, not in the West. And it occurred to the to, to the Soviets because they were so acutely aware of the way in which the Soviet civilian economy was lagging behind the West in microelectronics and computing. So they were looking at their own weaknesses and projecting out the meaning of that in terms of their enemy, right? War is reciprocal, that, that is why they looked at it in that way. And they, when they looked at it that way, they feared that this was a development that it will, would allow the West to fight a new sort of warfare in which armies could be much smaller, but have less mass in military parlance, while generating as much or more actual combat power. And their fear was that this would counterbalance the material preponderance of heavy Soviet military forces in ways that they couldn't match. <clears throat> the 1990-1991 Gulf War, in which an American-led coalition decisively defeated the Iraqi forces occupying Kuwait, and violently uh, expelled them at the cost of a very few coalition casualties, appeared to prove this concept. In some ways, that war became uh, a, a bit of a watershed, some, a, a bit like <clears throat> the First World War, in fact, not in scale, but in terms of the way that it was thought to signal the shape of future warfare. Although the West arrived at it belatedly, it soon adopted this idea that what had occurred was a, dig a new digital revolution in military affairs. And the gist of that idea was that high technology was going to enable relatively small and light Western armies to fight wars against powers that were not participating in the revolution, in the new age of warfare, cheaply, decisively, and quickly. <clears throat> In general terms, these beliefs accord, were reflected in, accord, were in accordance with larger ideas that were moving around in society at that time, um, which you may uh, uh, recall was resonantly described as a uh, new world order, a new world order which was distinctively unipolar with the United States un unambiguously at its head, and indeed was announced by the American political historian Francis Fukuyama to be the end of history. Uh, the idea being that no matter what else we would fight wars over after that, it wouldn't be constitutional order or, um, or economic models because liberal democratic capitalism had triumphed and that was the end of the story. Of course, that wasn't the end of the story, as we can all see in, in today's headlines uh, and have seen over the last 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 years, which is a about as solid a refutation of the end of history thesis as is, uh, as is possible. As with the transition from one age to another in previous times, though, what appears to be the direction of benefit initially has the potential to whip around drastically in an opposite direction as other powers adjust to whatever is the new normal. Likewise, the acceleration of the pace of change, which was such a strong aspect of the shift to industrial modernity seems to have accelerated again in our times by an, or, by an order of magnitude. To my, to my mind, the best example of this is the fact that the, is the effective deindustrialization of the West, which is a process uh, that has essentially occurred in little more than one generation. So very, very quickly. Okay, so for the remainder of the lecture, I'm just going to focus on three interconnected aspects of the still unfolding story of the military and strategic impact of the information age. <clears throat> the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, which began in the spring of 22, has put into sharp focus some matters which previously were present but were more dimly perceived than they are now. 
From the perspective of a Western man speaking to a Western audience, the picture is extremely alarming. The antecedents of the conflict date back to the invasion of Crimea in 2014, or even earlier, depending on where you wish to pick up the story of the confrontation between the two countries, in which the West is thoroughly imbricated from the beginning, that traces back to the dissolution of the USSR 30 years ago. It has evolved rapidly, however, into a proxy war between NATO and Russia, a fact which is utterly apparent if you happen to it just go, well, if you could go to the uh, NATO, he NATO headquarters in Brussels and look at the walls, uh, you would see this is completely uh, obvious because it's covered in, in propaganda posters on it. What is worrying from my perspective is, A, there is no chance for Western victory, let alone victory for Ukraine, which is already lost no matter what else happens. Well, for as long as the war continues, there's a worsening probability of escalation. The emerging Eurasian compact between China and Russia, which the West has motivated, is undoubtedly the most globally strategically consequential thing to have happened since the end of the Cold War and possibly more than the end of the Cold War. Anyway, it is a very big deal. The rise of China, which has historically been weaker than it ought to be for well over a century, is I think a reasonably historically natural process. The alignment of Russia with China is, was in no way inevitable, but that is the current uh, likelihood, and that is such a massive uh, on goal, as the British would say, uh, from a Western perspective. Then there is the self-injury done to what remains of Western industries and consumers by sanctions that have already exposed, uh, that have exposed already inflationary economies to a ballistic rise in energy costs that will last for as long as it takes to bring into operation alternative energies which will probably have to be something that at least half of the population is opposed to at, in the, uh, at, at, at this time. At the same time, sticking to more military matters, there is the problem that Western arsenals are being drained at an astonishing rate, which Western industries are unable to replenish at a strategically meaningful pace. On the other hand, at its current rate of expenditure of heavy artillery shells, Peak, which is peaking at about 50,000 uh, per day, it's estimated that Russia can keep on fighting as it is for another five and a half years. Moreover, that's only taking into account existing stockpiles, not new production, which is also sur surging. So the picture is, sim and the picture is similar with other weapons. Tanks and armored vehicles, there are tens of thousands in storage. Ballistic rockets and cruise missiles, thousands again. The fact is that here we are, 50 years or so into the in information age, and we are looking at what seems to be an industrial war conducted along a front of more than 1,500 miles, crisscrossed by trenches, trenches and fortifications out of the First World War, which would have been perfectly re recognizable to these fellows, in which Russia is winning inexorably on account primarily of its superiority in a sort of military muscle uh, that was supposed to be obsolescent by now. Moreover, the thing, things that you might have expected, like cyber attack in the conflict, or uh, even disinformation campaigns, a supposed long-standing Russian preoccupation, have been minor and ineffective, which is why Ukraine is so widely considered to be, uh, agreed to be winning the information war while losing the actual uh, war. If that's not paradoxical, then it's certainly contrary to uh, ex expectations. Why is that? Why has it happened? My guess is, I, I, I will. I, I, my guess is threefold. For a start, the main thing is that warfare is intrinsically self-balancing. The whole story I've told you already about change in warfare is is yes, of course it changes, but it it tends to balance out. It tends towards an equilibrium on the battlefield where certain durable factors become decisive. Those durable factors are, in my view, the ability to generate and sustain the application of physical force, i.e. logistics. Do you have weapons? Do you have supplies or not? The courage, secondly, the courage and endurance to sustain fighting in the, best, in the, in the face of the best efforts of your enemy to obliterate you i.e. what Napoleon famously called moral forces. 
And thirdly, the support of one's own population, what Clausewitz called passion. These things were true in agrarian warfare, they were true in industrial warfare, and uh, I think they're true of information age warfare. It follows, even in the information age, physical stuff matters. And even in previous ages, intangible things also mattered. Of course, it's not all simple. And to get deeper, I'll just try to draw you for you a mental picture. The scene is late April 2022, the location about a half mile behind the front line, somewhere in the Donbass region, where the commander of a Donetsk militia battalion is being interviewed at his headquarters, at his mobile headquarters, by a Russian military reporter. This battalion has been in hard fighting against Ukrainian forces for weeks, uh, generally very successfully. Ge generally very successfully. The commander, who is a formal, former local bureaucrat working in local government, has been at war since 2014. Yet, ultimately, he's also an amateur because he has almost no uh, formal professional military uh, uh, training relative to his rank. Uh, and I refer to an actual interview which was carried on the Telegram channel of the Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, which I urge people to, to follow. It's very interesting. I draw your attention, firstly, to the headquarters I mentioned, because at first glance, if you're looking at this scene, you would probably not recognize it as such, because it's nothing more than a commercial panel van that has been painted green and has a, Z a big white Z splashed on the side. On the inside of the vehicle, there are two large screen TVs mounted on, on, on the walls, connected to a jury-rigged communication system, uh, at the heart of which there are a couple of laptop computers. There's an army corporal sitting on a plastic lawn chair in the back of this vehicle, tapping on the computers. He seems to be running the whole thing. There are a bunch of mobile phones around. On the television screens, there is showing live stream imagery from 12 different commercial drones, at least three for each of the companies under this battalion, uh, battalion's command. It is certainly not a pretty setup. The total cost, I would estimate, including the van and the drones, might be 50,000 euros, possibly 25,000 euros if you could get to Costco or whatever, okay, depending how much you spent on the van. It is, however, undeniably effective. Equally, that commander is undeniably participating in information age warfare, uh, to my mind, and to my mind in a war-winning way that I would describe as networked, network-enabled attrition. It's a relentless and progressive wearing down of your enemy by fire by, uh, that is aided by digital systems that are obtained cheaply so that the effort is sustainable and operated effectively enough to be superior to the, to the operations of one's, uh, one's enemy. Moore's Law. I, I'm sure everybody here is probably familiar with Moore's Law. Basically, the, the idea is that the, 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 cost of the, 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 the cost of a given amount of, com, of computing uh, uh, is decli declines drastically because the number of transistors on an integrated circuit the, uh, uh, doubles so rapidly, in, case of, uh, in this case, every, every two years, I think he says. So this is why you'll probably have heard the, the, the quip that there's more computing power in your Apple, in your Apple Watch than there was in uh, uh, the computers that landed people on the moon a half century ago. Of course, that goes for military equipment too. In the West, however, the way military procurement works is over much longer timescales, more, more like 20 than two years, and virtually never with off-the-shelf components. As a result, the cost of a Don Donetsk-style headquarters for the German army or for the British army uh, would probably be in the millions, not 50,000 euros, but uh, 5 million, 10 million uh, euros. It would take five years to plan, it would take 10 years to implement, and it, so it would be based on 15-year-old technology. In other words, it would probably be prettier, but it's not as good and vastly more expensive. The example I've given is recent and small, but it's not at all unique. It's a pattern that exists broadly across essentially all military equipment, including things usually considered to be top of the line. 
Think for, the exa for example of the computing power of the new American F-35 fighter, air fighter aircraft. Uh, it's a vital quali quality. It's the software of the plane that not particularly it's avionics that is supposed to make it exceptional. That's what the, you were paying. Uh, I don't think Germany's bought one yet. But anyway, if you had bought F-35, what you're mainly buying is a software package with the name airplane attached, okay? The newest Tesla ex electric motor car, motor car possesses 100 times more uh, processing capability than the F-35, a fraction of the cost. The fact is that military technology has not been leading civilian technology in this sphere at any rate for decades now, but our defense procurement patterns still suggest that they do. Simply put, it's not in military applications where the rapid growth in information technological capability is being applied, not in the West at any rate. It is elsewhere, however, most obviously in Russia now, even if it's in a jury-rigged fashion, uh, which is enabling them to catch up very rapidly in capability at a, and at a fraction of the cost. It reminds me, finally, of the soldiers and officers of the First World War who contrived the modern system of warfare warfare out of a cobbled together assemblage of random parts, agricultural machinery that they bolted uh, iron plates to, which is effectively what a tank was at the time, um, balsa wood and canvas airplanes that they figured out how to bolt machine guns to, right? Um, okay, the result then was not also not pretty, but it did work, uh, and it defined warfare for the, for the century to come. Necessity is the mother of, of invention, uh, so they say. My concern is that the West has played at war for too long and too long been insulated from necessity to be inventive now when it really counts. That is not a safe position uh, for us to be in. <clears throat> I'd be remiss not to consider in this lecture also the role of the broader information environment in contemporary conflict. If I were to ignore it, it might be to suggest that my earlier declaration that physical stuff still matters means that in intangible things do not matter. I do not believe that is the case. Both are important. The physical and the intangible are, are matter and have always mattered. The way that it plays out in a hyper-connected world like ours, which moreover being highly materialistic, another main attribute of modernism, is quite out of practice with moral argument, is all extremely perplexing. But is it truly more difficult today than it was in the past? Contem if you ask contemporary strategists, the answer is yes. Uh, and that is because people have a tendency to bemoan the special complexity of the time that they are in. Um, it's a natural uh, human, uh, human problem. We think we've got it hard and our forebears had it easier. Uh, or times were simpler, uh, to put it more, more precisely. Honestly, though, I'm not sure that a field commander during the Cathar Wars of the 13th century or the Thirty Years' War might not have envied the relative political simplicity of conflicts now. The moral dimension of war has always been a massive challenge. In the early 2000s, the American political scientist Joseph Nye coined the term soft power to describe a form of power that is based upon the relative attractiveness of a country's image and culture, as opposed to its hard power, which is a, mil a measure of its military potential with strong links to industrial power, access to strategic resources, and so on. It is, in a sense, a very information age concept. Rather, it, it's kind of like a, a corporate brand, but national, right? Apple, Coca-Cola, Nike, Volkswagen. It's very clear that there's value in it, but it's intangible, making it, its measurement uh, highly subjective. Long before Nye came along, however, the armed forces of the major nations took seriously the idea of that information warfare, according to a broad interpretation of the term, was about the management of the perception of, conf of a given conflict. If winning war, in short, is about exhausting one's opponent's will to continue fighting, then it follows that targeting the mood, beliefs, ideals, and so on of an enemy population is a key element of war strategy. This idea is as old as war itself. It was the basic strategy behind the defeat of the Soviet Union in the Cold War also. A contemporary twist in it stems from the fact, stems from that we tend now not to go to war per se. 
with other nations, but rather we get into conflict with illegitimate regimes, illegitimate uh, regimes. Obviously, it complicates messaging greatly uh, when you are bombing an ostensibly not an enemy population for their own good. You can be a very good marketer, a superbly skilled marketer, and find that a difficult proposition to sell. A further twist is that the logical endpoint of any argument that says war is a contest of wills between populations is that you must also attend to the management of the mood of your own people. The obvious problem here is that operations to affect the mood of the domestic population, propaganda, in other words, is something which most democracies are leery of doing uh, openly. The fact is that for 100 years, no good propagandist would allow themselves to be called a propagandist. That's the rule number one of propaganda studies. Don't allow, don't, don't mention propaganda. Don't mention fight club. Don't mention propaganda club. In fact, in the United States, up until the 2012 passing of the Smith-Munt Modernization Act, the government was legally uh, forbidden to propagandize domestically. It is now permitted to do so, and does so very industriously. The currently used term of art for propaganda is strategic communication, and it is a burgeoning industry. Uh, some of you may work in that field, is, uh, I don't know, uh, quite likely. Currently, it is the most popular master's program in the Department of War Studies at King's College London, where I, I teach, which is a clear indication of the perception of need for the subject. Consider, propaganda, whatever we call it, is and always has been a primary aspect of warfare because people need to be motivated quite passionately by war. Otherwise, why would they sacrifice? Warfare in the information age, moreover, is occurring in a context where the density of communication channels, the potential visibility of small and distant events, the range of potential audiences for any given story is much greater than in the past. In other words, it's quite difficult. The, the context, I, I would suggest that context is uh, challenging in that way. But more fundamentally, it's challenging in that there is a, there is a great need for myth for, or meta-narrative. If you are at war and you are engaging with a, a, a population's passion, which is an emotion after all, uh, you, need to use, uh, you need to have access to myth. Um, if we equate the information age and postmodernism, as seems reasonable considering we tend to equate industri the industrial age and modernism, it is a problem that postmodernists define hostility, uh, postmodernists define postmodernism as uh, one that is uh, as intrinsically hostile to meta narrative or myth. The, net, the internet, moreover, has a tendency to fragment audiences rather than unify them. It may sound strange to say this, but I mean this very deliberately. The lack of myth power, the ability to call on a population to sacrifice, is the most, strategic de the most st strategically debilitating thing in the West today, followed closely by the collapse in levels of trust in society both problems empirically observed by social scientists. War is fundamentally a collective societal effort and a society which is unable to sacralize politically instrumental violence, which is war, cannot fight well. A society which is unable to define itself collectively in a way that is meaningful to its supposed members will self-evidently be unable to generate coherent collective effort. On the contrary, it will be brittle and a fractured mass that is very vulnerable to external probes that are meant to split it and to shatter it. Uh, I went today to the German Historical Museum where there's a terrific uh, exhibit on identity and passports, uh, which I encourage you uh, to, uh, to go to if you haven't done so, because it is a superb illustration of the points uh, which I have just made, if in a slightly different way with a rather less alarming conclusion. Why am I alarmed? Well, I'm alarmed because as Europe moves into a cold winter with insufficient gas, sputtering industries and already inflationary economies, we now see leaders attempting to psychologically prepare populations for pain. In the last two weeks, both uh, Macron in France and Boris Johnson in the UK have made speeches to this effect.
I'm extremely dubious of the likelihood of success of these pleas uh, and consider it rather more likely that the people of those countries will react to the realization of chronic malgovernance of their nations rather like the people of Sri Lanka have done in their country in recent months. The irony is that after September 11, 2001, one of the most popular ways for governments to describe the war on terror was as a war of ideas, which is to say it would be a global war for the hearts and minds of people that would be fought primarily through persuasion and by, uh, demon by a demonstrable example of a better way of life. Undoubtedly, this contradiction, the contradiction between what is said and what is done, i.e. physical military intervention in countries, uh, was not completely thought through at the time, nor has it been uh, since. Furthermore, though, what happens when the putatively better way turns out not to be better at all? The answer, I fear, is a precipitate, co precipitate collapse in credibility. Whatever the difficulty of measuring soft power scientifically, there are several plausible methods for making relative rankings and rough estimations. What these show over the last 20 years is that the soft power of the United States, to take an, obvi uh, an obvious example, is somewhat diminished within the West. A 2018 poll found that 49% of French people and uh, Germans agreed with the statement, US power and influence is a major threat to our country. However, uh, by and large, it seems to be the case that while Western countries like and trust each other less than they did 20 years ago, they still dislike and mistrust other countries uh, outside of their club more. Outside the West, the picture is quite different. In the same 2018 poll, only 43% of Russians shared the same apprehension about America as France and Germany did. Uh, that number, I would guess, is probably now doubled if we take surveys for, about Putin's domestic satisfaction ratings uh, credibly, currently over 80% as a reasonable proxy. Attitudes in China are hardly less disagreeable from a Western perspective, something which we can glean from the increasingly belligerent tone of Chinese foreign ministry statements in, in recent months. Both Russia and China, moreover, are working hard and with a good deal of success to win over the rest of the world to their point of view. In the case of the Middle East, notably Syria, but also astonishingly Saudi Arabia, as well as Africa, the degree of receptiveness to Russian and Chinese perspective is quite surprising. The bottom line is that the West, in my view, is that the Western proposition to the world is badly discredited, not by its ideals per se. People like freedom. Nobody does not like freedom and prosperity but by the perception that the West now, deeply embroiled in its own internal culture war, no longer obviously epitomizes those things. That is a collapse in credibility. That's what I mean by a credibility collapse. The manner of the American withdrawal from Af Afghanistan in the summer of 2021 appeared to confirm the worst about Western cre credibility and also to further poison relationships within the West. It was not just the chaotic nature of the scenes at the Kabul airport, which could easily have turned into a repeat of the French disaster at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. It is likely the only reason that was avoided was a massive payoff to the Taliban, which ultimately was almost as eager as the White House to get American troops out. An even more wounding problem was that after 20 years in Afghanistan, alongside the United States, Britain, for example, was not even informed that, it was a, that the withdrawal was about to occur. In the UK at the time, uh, there was a minor political scandal after the withdrawal on account of the fact that the foreign minister as well as his deputy and a bunch of other uh, senior government officials were all out of the country on holiday. Uh, and the reason for that was simply that none of them had any idea that the Biden administration had decided to pull, out, had decided to pull the plug, that they were leaving immediately uh, because they didn't tell them. Uh, they learned the event, uh, of the event more or less like you did by seeing it uh, on the news. Furthermore, coming to the end now, since the end of the Cold War, all Western wars have been sub-strategic in nature. By, by sub-strategic, I mean they occurred not because survival was at stake, uh, was at stake nor even always that there was any uh, vital national interest in, in play, but out of a perception 
on the part of politicians that they had to respond to a public urge that something must be done about something awful happening in the world. And people's apprehension, of course, because we are so connected, people are connected in a way that they see these distant events and feel strongly about them. So politicians are responding to an urge that something must be done. <clears throat> in other words, many wars have been fought in the last generation as essentially as set pieces in domestic political theater, not as aspects of, of overarching international strategy. Something must be done is the call. It doesn't need to be particularly effective and probably will not be. Uh, but a gesture is required, and it has, and therefore, in the nature, it is in the na nature of gestures to be kept cheap. The politics of this are completely logical, and I, I think completely defensible, defensible from a political point of view. The problem is that they're low, also low and dishonest, and over time, the repeated pattern of them it further erodes credibility, trust, and ultimately the perception of elite competence. The situation where we've now arrived, in my observation, has some of the elements of dramatic tra tragedy. Out of a combination of desire to do the right thing, at any rate to be seen to be doing the right thing, and to lash out after suffering a very surprising attack on September 11th, the West has drained out its own capital of credibility and trust. The two qualities, unfortunately, which are the most vital in a war of ideas. Once again, uh, it is a very unsafe uh, situation. Finally, in, con in conclusion, <clears throat> some time ago I mentioned the thousands of years long agrarian era of human civilization as compared to the couple of centuries long industrial era, era which has been followed by an information era that perhaps we might say is a half century long now. I noted also the distinctions between these era, eras are, is quite fuzzy. Uh, things that were important in previous ages often continue to be important in the following ones, or they seemingly shift out of interest for a while, only to come back at a later point, producing what my colleague David Edgerton has called a shock of the old. Russia, I have argued, is right now winning an information war because it still has so much old school industrial muscle, military, specifically military industrial muscle. Are we still in the in industrial age then? For that matter, one of the biggest concerns of governments outside of the West about the coming winter is not energy, but food supply. Collectively, Ukraine and Russia grow most of the grain that feeds North Africa and the Middle East, particularly Egypt. If that supply is imperiled, then what we've been calling the migrant crisis up until now will look like nothing in comparison. So are we even out of the agricultural era then? Uh, indulge me for a moment in an, in an anecdote. Recently I picked up my teenage daughter from her work in the local library where she'd just done her first full eight hour shift, she's 17. She was hungry and exhausted. Her immediate needs, therefore, were to get home, have something to eat, and go to bed. Take me home so I can eat and sleep. So far, so much in accordance with Maslow's famous hierarchy of needs, which has physiological needs right at the base. As we drove off in the car, however, her first need was to connect her mobile phone to the Bluetooth system so that she can continue the podcast or whatever it is she'd been left listening to before she went to work. So for the first two minutes of our drive home, we argued because I needed her to put her seatbelt on, which is a security need, right? Which she insisted she could not do before satisfying her psychological need to be connected. I think this il illustrates something useful, maybe, about the general topic that we've been discussing. The ways in which we seek to satisfy basic physiological needs is different from age to age. We are, after all, not pre-humans on the African savanna bashing each other's heads in uh, with animal thigh bones anymore. We do it differently, but the needs themselves do not go away. Perhaps the order of priority that we give to some secondary psychological and self-fulfillment needs 
uh, uh, is different from one era to another. In some cases, we might even put certain sorts of self-fulfillment goals ahead of security ones to a degree. For certain, there's a palpable need uh, in people to be constantly connected to information, which is obvious why, you know, when people do this, you know, do I have my keys, my phone, and my wallet? Uh, and if you don't, as I put my phone somewhere, you a pang of nervousness in realizing that you don't have your phone on you. And short, last paragraph. On a macro scale, reality is also a sort of palimpsest in which ages are not replaced, but rather another layer is added over top of the pre-existing one. In the case of warfare, this is undoubtedly the case. The most powerful digital system is of little use if some commando has just stabbed its operator through the eyeball with a pointed stick. For that matter, if you want to shut down the critical infrastructure of an enemy at whom, with whom you are at, at war, openly at war, there are easier and more effective ways of doing it than with cyber attack. The big lesson in the long view, in my opinion, is against complacency. Great powers rise and fall within any given era for all, kinds of, uh, for all kinds of reasons, not requiring any sort of change from one age to another. But paradigmatic social changes, like we are observing now, seem to sweep away the status quo ante with shocking speed and ease. And that's it. Thank you very much. So thanks. Uh, hello, am I on? I can't hear myself. Am I on? Can you hear me? A little bit? There we are. Uh, thank you so much, David, for this very rich, very outspoken, and in some cases very controversial uh, talk. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, the two of us now for a little bit, and then of course you here, the audience, um, and all the people watching on your devices at home. I'd like to start on a more general note before we, of course, will be zooming in into the current uh, war you've talked about extensively. Also, now we here in Germany, we definitely know about you know um, old technology, not superseding uh, a new technology. When we think of all the fax machines that uh, had a big comeback here in this country that were collecting the COVID cases and uh, centralizing them in a, a database, actually. That was one thing where we uh, got very near to this uh, observation of yours. Um, you talked about this continuity instead of revolution uh, with many examples. One example I found particularly interesting when we can uh, go back to this historical perspective to begin now. And you talked about the Napoleonic mindset uh, of the generality, right, in, uh, in the First World War that actually led to the great carnage of the, especially the first two years uh, of World War I. Can you uh, dive a little deeper into what actually that mindset was about and how uh, uh, it was able to do that much damage? It was not just technology, but also mindset you were talking about, right? Uh, okay, oh, yeah, that's on. So, Napoleonic mindset. Well, it's not too, I, I don't mean, uh, uh, it's not very complicated what I, what I mean. Huh. Most, of the, most of the First World War Generals, European or the European generals during the First World War, their uh, their mental image of what warfare was going to to be like was primarily formed by the Napoleonic experience, which was the last big example of uh, intra-European war on a large scale. Of course, between the Napoleonic War and the First World War, a lot happened in terms of uh, well, technology, uh, 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 obviously. And there were signs through the 19th century that things were changing. If you looked at the American Civil War, which had a distinctively industrial flavor, right? one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that the North prevails was because of its industrial muscle. I mentioned the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. Okay, you one could look at that and say, well, things are happening with respect to um, the technology of transportation, which is which are having a, a, a big material effect on, on the battlefield. Uh, the Boer War, um, there were signs there, both of the increasing le lethality of, um, of, uh, uh, of uh, rifled weapons and, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and so on, as well as uh, signs coming out of the, Bol 
the Boer War, particularly in terms of the connectedness of global society, right? So one of the reasons that the Boer War is so traumatic for the British is that um, because there's already an inter international media at, at that point in which the British Empire is is uh, portrayed, particularly in, in continental European, French media especially, as a, as a, as a big bully, a, a, yeah. essentially. Um, so there were signs of that things were changing, but they, you know, they weren't picked up on uh, as they might have as they might have been. That in itself is is a lesson of not igno not ignoring the signals that are coming that are contrary to um, the uh, existing perception of uh, uh, of uh, 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 the prevailing yeah. the, the security of the prevailing paradigm. But fundamentally, yes, so the, the, the senior generals were informed by a particular image of, of warfare uh, which didn't sit which didn't uh, work in an environment where there had been such leaps in the lethality of weapons. Mm -hmm. There had been such leaps in terms of the, uh, the visibility of military operations from above. Right, so there have been balloons before, but the, the, the so these sorts of things uh, occurred, and all of that happened very, very rapidly in the in the in the context of uh, major modern states essentially exercising the full societal muscle, so putting essentially every able-bodied or able-bodied person that they could get on 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 the front lines, which all added up to a tremendous amount of uh, of bloodshed. Much of it, much of it, uh, much of it wasted, until they figured out how to fight under yeah. modern uh, conditions, which it, which they did ultimately. Now, obviously, I'm not a military historian, but I would think that um, some of the you know premises of how an army was organized 100 years ago and today are very different. Uh, all the generals and officers were, most of them were aristocrats uh, at the time. That's not really the case anymore. There's a, a totally different kind of upward mobility possible in um, many armies, I would think. Uh, I hope this is safe to say like this. But yet, you are describing something that reminds me of this Napoleonic uh, example. When you uh, talked about the Donbass uh, example, right? About the network enabled attrition. A relentless and progressive wearing down of one's enemy by fire aided cheap digital systems. When you were mentioning the van uh, and concluding there uh, by saying military tech in the West, at least, is not leading but lagging. With the F-35 you mentioned and you would say that this whole rig that they had there uh, behind the front line would cost 50,000 euros, it would cost about 5 million if it were the British Army. Uh, right now, why is that? Is it this is a, a similar clash of mindsets happening right in this situation? Or why would it not be possible for Ukraine, for a British Army, for NATO in the end? We don't know that. Uh, to do the same thing for the same amount of money. Um, I, I, I give two two answers, uh, which are or two aspects of the same answer. The first is that uh, the West has not fought a proper war uh, in well over a, a generation. We fought wars of wars of choice, right? We fought uh, wars in which we had a huge material preponderance. Except perhaps for uh, the Kosovo War, uh, where the Serbs did have, uh, the Serbs did have a relatively capable air, uh, air defense system. All of our wars have been fought in, uh, in a context in which we had uh, unchallenged uh, air power, complete impunity uh, in, in, in the sky. Uh, so I, I give that just as an example of many ways in which the wars that we have been fighting uh, have not been terribly, have not been challenging in the way in which uh, the interstate conventional war, uh, wars mm -hmm. uh, um, can be, and, mm -hmm. this, uh, and indeed this one is. The second point I would uh, raise, it just occurred to me now while you were uh, asking this question, I was thinking about class structure and, and the like. I think it's true. We 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 don't have the same. We don't have the same. You know, our our parent societies don't have the same underlying class structure, class distinctions, as, ex, as existed at that time. And 
uh, recruitment is, is, is different. So indeed, that pattern is, I would suggest, is not really the same, or I wouldn't wish to say that that is uh, the same because I, I don't think it is. But I do think that if you look at, uh, you know, senior generals or all, your office, senior generals are drawn from the same managerial class. They are drawn from the same bureaucratic class as all, the rest of the civilian uh, elite is. Mm. And that is why I would, I would suggest that you see this natural progression from senior military leadership to corporate board to executive director, not you know, not or not not exe uh, non-executive director uh, roles in defense industry and so on. Um, why is it? Because those are the same people. They're in the same. That's the that's the you know, that's the officer stratum uh, uh, today. And I in in that way, I do think that you know possibly. Not possibly. I think our society is also stratif stratified uh, uh, today. Not quite in the same ways in which it, 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 it does, but it does have that character to it. And for sure, our, our, our senior officers are drawn from that, man that managerial class, um, which is, you know, in some sense is fine. Why, why else would you, you, you tend to draw your managerial class from your educational elite? Uh, so that makes sense, but on the downside, that uh, coming all from the same class, they tend to have all the same ideas, all the same backgrounds tend to lead to the, you know, the same ways of looking at things, uh, and you know, progressive, uh, mm, uh, same, same, same tends to lead to non-creative solu non uh, solutions and established pat patterns. Anyway, that, uh, not to mention the fact that, that I just spoke about of the transition of senior leadership into in military mm. into senior leadership in industry is undoubtedly in no small part uh, an explanation of the reason for the gigantic costs of, um, of uh, mil military equipment. We have to open up soon um, due to the progressing time, and I would have lots of questions about the technology, actually, but I think one very strong point uh, we have to refer to now in this conversation you made is about the power of myth-making and um, the lack thereof in the West, you pointed out. Um, and you argued that the Internet has this fracturing tendency to sort of de-unify um, a society. Now, I am not so sure about this, um, because there's also very unifying tendencies in a lot of, it can mobilize a lot of people. It uh, can um, put a lot of people into power of, uh, you know, emancipation uh, movements we've had in the last 10 or 15 years. I would say this is a stronghold of Western democracy. And many people in the East will probably say the same, at least many Ukrainians would say that this kind of liberty uh, would be one of the strongholds that actually in favor of Western democracy. Now you're saying no, uh, it's actually quite a threat to what we need in order to go to war. Or am I quoting you, or is this incorrect now? When no, I'm I don't think we have to end our friendship over this, uh, this uh, <laughs> because it's not a gigantic di uh, disagreement. I, I, I believe, you know, as I said, a, a lot of the, I mean, a, I mean, all of this is very complicated, and there are elements of backwards and backwards and 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 forward and forwards and contrary indicators across a lot of things. Uh, and I think the 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 invention of new media types, uh, the impact of that on on a, on society is is interesting, uh, and it tends so. To, and part of the reason I I said what I said about the internet is uh, from looking at the invention of uh, a print. So print, when you look at the invention of print, what happens is, on the one hand, you do get a certain unifying effect. You get a strong unifying effect within sciences, for example, because now, once you start writing things down, and, or, sorry, not once you, once you start printing things, so that becomes the authoritative uh, authoritative version of something, that can then be shared around all sorts of science, so you're not working off you know, fragmentary bits. So there's a unifying effect going on within science and philosophy and all kinds of, uh, all, all kinds of uh, thinking at that level. At the same time, there's an enormously fragmenting effect at all other levels in society. What else occurs around that? That's when you get into the, the basically the wars of the, the 
wars of the Ref, uh, the wars of the Refor Reformation. You get the pamphlet sure. wars. The pamphlet wars. The key is in the title. What is it? You know, right? You're having pamphlet wars because now people are able to produce uh, uh, pamphlets. So there's there is there is simultaneously some in some sure. ways a, a, a unification and in in other ways a fracturing. And I think that's probably the case in our, our in our society in our society uh, today. Um, what is happening in our society? I don't think it's too controversial to to, to say that identity politics has become very mainstream, if not completely dominant, in most in most Western societies. That is, in one sense, that is groups of people finding affinity with each other with a per, with over a particular uh, whatever the issue might be. Uh, and they can do so because of the death of distance or the greater connectivity or what, what have you. On the other hand, there's a there's a co, uh, an, an actually colossal dim diminishment in other um, in in other uh, affinities, which I would argue uh, matter, or certainly they matter in the context of warfare, particularly in a, in, in a if if you have a collapse in national affinity or a national identity, it's very hard to draw on the nation. What are you, because what are you talking about, uh, right? Um, another, yeah, so I think that there, there are, the, the, the two things uh, are, are, uh, uh, are occurring. And insofar as I, as I said that war is a collective effort that is, uh, uh, that is primarily, it, it, uh, that involves uh, states. I mean, I'm not trying to argue there aren't different sorts of non-state warfare, mm -hmm. but let's stick to st state on state for the uh, moment. Not being able to call on, uh, on a national identity seriously compromises your nat national power. And if you're looking for reasons, you know, wh why there is more endurance on one side than another, then I think that's a good one. That's the primary one for me. Well, in Germany, we're kind of sensitive to the mere idea of uh, national myth, of course, uh, since after World War II, that's maybe one thing. And another one is uh, one of my favorite quotes of the, you probably know her, the American historian Jill Lepore, who's always saying the US of A fractured since 1776, uh, that this is actually something that is driving um, democracy, uh, dissent and the possible to stage that dissent and uh, to stage it publicly and very fiercely, if you have to. But, uh, let the public actually <laughs> not decide, but uh, delve deeper now and ask questions to uh, this aspect, and many other aspects this wonderful lecture has covered by David. We'll start by the audience. You probably have to wait for the May microphone. Where is the microphone? It's coming right to you. Please wait for it because we're broadcasting here. Please. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your insights. Um, you really covered a very gloomy picture, right? We, the West is losing the material war, the West is losing the war of ideas, so it loses the social material paradigm war. Uh, and so as a scholar of innovation and entrepreneurship, I wondered whether it is partially, uh, the material side could be partially because uh, the West is doing an industrial way of sourcing instead of an entrepreneurial way of sourcing, right? And it loses the social paradigmatic war because it's not creating unify, unity in diversity with regards to norms, values, and so on. But the European ideal could be a unifying norm above maybe the nation state. So my question to you is, what do you advise then politicians, uh, do you actually advise them, do they listen to you, but what do you advise them to do then to actually kind of shift that and win this uh, paradigmatic war uh, against Russia? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm smiling because uh, Toby started to say that I was controversial, but I don't think I'd been controversial. So what I'm about to say will be controversial. <laughs> You're not going to win. There is, I, I would advise them to drop the idea of winning this war. You have to end it now. Uh, like I noticed, uh, I, I read today that uh, That's what I meant by controversial. electricity costs in Germany have increased by 720% in the last six, 720%. In six months, uh, that's that's a that's a you know why because of policy decisions. That's a suicide note for the industri the the biggest industrial economy uh, in in Europe. Um, I could I I could go on. Britain uh, 
it was announced today that uh, gas prices had increased by 80%. Uh, that the majority of British homes by mid by midwinter will be in a state of uh, what's called fuel fuel poverty. Um, this is not sustainable. It's not. It, it, my opinion is that that is that that is uh, not sustainable. Uh, and I also think so. So I think the war needs to be ended. Uh, and we and also I think that everybody knows what the outcome of the war is going to be. We've known since day, you've known since day one that there is some some sort of political uh, that there is some sort of partition of Ukraine uh, because it's not a, it's it can't hold itself to get together as the country uh, which it was. Um, that's just the facts of it. So you need to end the war now, and for that to occur, you need to start. You need to talk to the Russians directly. What do you want? Uh, like, what is it that what is it that will satisfy you that is not so humiliating to the West that we can't, you know, sell it to people and climb out of the, um, the well of bad decisions uh, uh, made? So a real heart-to-heart -heart discussion. And I would urge, moreover, there has to be a, 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 that an object of that discussion, too, has to be to gauge the Russians on what what really is it that they see in terms of the, their alignment with China in the long term. Because this Eurasian compact of, of Russia and China uh, is the thing which, which uh, geostrategists have been warning against from the very day that geostrategy was, was invented. Um, it's, it's very, very dangerous. So we need to swallow our pride, end the war, have, have grown-up discussions uh, with Russia, and, and uh, do it now. That was, that's what I would advise. Thank you. Do we have another question from the floor? There's one right at the bar to the left-hand side from the stage. Um, yes, good evening, and thank you for the lecture. Uh, you are in Berlin, uh, the, the former capital of Prussia, and you've been talking about the Napoleonic Wars. I think there were two lessons for Prussia from the Napoleonic Wars. The first one was, you have to be friends with Russia. Only with uh, an, an alliance with Russia, you, the, the German state can kind of survive with, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the concert of European nations. But the second one was, um, after the blockade, the, the, the British blockade of the, con the continental blockade, that the war had um, kind of boosted innovation, industrialization. Now, if we are at a, uh, a different times now, um, don't you think that the West being under blockade from Russia for fossil energies, this could be a good thing, because it promotes and boosts innovation here towards different energies? But then, of course, the question is, Germany in the 20th century then allied with the US. What does a country or the, should Europe do, uh, being neighbor of Russia, being aligned to the US, which you think is, you know, kind of de a declining power? Um, okay. Uh, well, that's very interesting from the point of, yes, uh, uh, from your remarks about uh, uh, Russia, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to understand that point of view, and so thank you for mentioning it. Uh, for, with respect to, can, can we l look at the, the, the benefits of, of, of blockade, of saying that this is, you know, I suppose, it's a spur to innovation in uh, mm -hmm. alternatives. And uh, yes, that, that may be, I guess that might be the case. I, I, you know, I, I, I hope so. Uh, I'm in generally in favor of, of, of innovation uh, and of spurring things along, but uh, you know, I think it's a it, it's a, not a really a good way to spur uh, innovation. Yes, war is to your question about what is good, war good for. War war does tend to spur innovation. That's that's or to some extent, uh, yeah, it does. It does drive things have a tendency to drive things, but it but its costs are so dramatic. Um, a friend of mine uh, was quite overweight, uh, and then he got cancer, and got, had uh, uh, months of chemotherapy, and then at the end of which 
He was not overweight at all. Uh, is chemotherapy a good way, is cancer a good way to lose weight, apparently? But I wouldn't suggest it, and I wouldn't suggest that, that, um, that running, a, run, uh, going, having a proxy war with Russia uh, that involves a, a, a blockade of uh, fertilizers, gas, oil, number of strate very strategic minerals and, and, and the like is, uh, is, is a good way to spur uh, innovation in, in other things. It may turn out in, in the end for the good. I suppose in the long, you know, in the long run, uh, in the short run, I'm pessimistic. In the long run, I'm optimistic. I don't know why that's the reverse <laughs> of it. Uh, you know, things will work out because we'll all be dead, I guess. Um, but anyway, no, I don't think it's a good, uh, good way forward. Maybe, it, maybe it'll uh, have that, but you'll go through such enormous amounts of pain uh, that it won't be worth it. You know, I started off my career really focusing on Eastern Europe. I was a Soviet military analyst to start with, and uh, during the 1990s, I spent a lot of time uh, in Russia and, uh, and in the East, Eastern Europe uh, generally. And you really don't want, as a society, to experience double-digit GDP decline. It, it will, it will uh, derange your society for ma many generations. Um, and that's, that's what's, at, what's at risk, I think. It's probably, uh, again, an ambivalence in the word good. What is it good for, economically speaking or ethically speaking, in this, uh, in this sense, right? It's quite of a different uh, thing, especially people probably knew in Detroit that war was good for innovation because it spurred uh, automotive innovation, too, um, after World War I. Uh, and then, again, do we have a question from the digital sphere, from Slido? So, uh, please, Sarah, let us know what's going on on Slido and the participatory t tool that people watching it at home could use. Um, you have said during your presentation, war is a wage of humans for now. Is that a reference to artificial intelligence? Uh, yes. Yes, it was. Uh, so, um, I di I di I, no, I, I didn't talk about uh, artificial intelligence. I may well have. I said I was not going to talk too much about uh, technology, but that was exactly what I was uh, getting at. And you're, so the questioner is very uh, perceptive at, at this. And the, the, the thing was, I was saying that there are certain, uh, certain things about uh, aspects of war which are in its nature, its chances, chanciness, its reciprocality, uh, and uh, uh, the fact that it uh, involves violence. And I think that those, so long as it is hum human beings doing, doing war, that is going to be the case. If it, when it is AI, in, when you throw AI into the mix, I think that it is possible uh, to, that all that would, that that would change. I mean, insofar as AI is not a human, uh, doesn't, doesn't, won't necessarily think as humans do. It is, I, I think it would be interesting, for example, if you had a general AI, that is to say an AI which actually had feelings and ideas in its own internal monologue and its own sense of... We don't have that. <laughs> right? And wasn't simply a, 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 an algorithm, a, a very sophisticated algorithm. It would be interesting to ask uh, um, such an entity what it thought war was good for. Um, because it might come up with, well, I don't know what, that, what the answer would be, but that might be a very consequential answer. It might decide that war is not good for anything and you guys aren't permitted to do it anymore. Um, on the other hand, it might decide that war is terrifically good and there you get all kinds of other scenarios which might include your guys' propensity for this destructive thing is, is uh, not something I want to have around. So. But anyway, yes, that your questioner was correct. That's what I was. Let's take another question from from Slido, maybe, or was that it for for the moment? Um, oh, you're pressing on the microphone. Yeah, okay. sorry. Right. Um, thank you. I wanted to ask you about. You said war is reciprocal, and you talked about your students in your department study studying strategic communications, and I was wondering maybe these students studying strategic communications in the UK, in the West, isn't that wasted time in a way when you think about 
how is idea war going to be reciprocal if this Eurasian alliance that you're describing is going to shut off its internet and its social media for the Chinese firewall, which for now in Russia isn't as effective, but sooner or later is going to be. So how are idea wars going to be reciprocal in this way? And why do we have to practice attack if we don't really know whether we are going to be able to practice it? Okay. Uh, well, if I, I may, I, I, don't, I don't want to you know, distress my colleagues or something. But it, it's, a, it's an open information that, that our strategic communications program is very popular with the Chinese, mm. um, right? Uh, the War Studies Department, as, as, you know, the whole college, but the War Studies Department has a primarily international um, uh, student body. Um, so, you know, at, at any given time, you know, you get, we, we will have, oh, I can't give you numbers at, at the, at, uh, off the top of my head, uh, nor even if I knew them, should I probably say them on uh, a microphone, but it, you know, there are a lot of Chinese students who are interested in pursuing the study of strategic communications at King's College London Department of War Studies. And uh, presumably that is because they apprehend, uh, I mean, the, no doubt some of them are funded by the Chinese government or perceive that those are skills which, will, which would be uh, very marketable in, in China. And just like, you know, when I was uh, an undergraduate and I was studying uh, Russian, Russian language and command economics, uh, that was because uh, we had the idea that you, you should try to think like your enemy thinks, to learn how your en uh, enemy thinks. And I think there is some of that, uh, some of that uh, going on, or a lot of that uh, going on. Um, I'm not sure that's an, an, an answer to the question, but it is, it, it tip, you know, a, a, a further explanation of, I think, the... the the, the fact that this is this is a, an area of study that is regarded as integral to uh, contemporary conflict, not just in the West, but uh, but but broadly, uh, you know, uh, other countries also see that this is something that they need to um, that they they need to um, be involved in, uh, and no doubt they have their own national centers uh, working on this sort of thing. Thank you for this insight here, David. Once again, uh, can we take one more question from Slido, maybe, before slowly wrapping this up due to yes, the time? Yes, of course. Um, in the very beginning, you mentioned that your view of whether good reason for waging war exists has changed over the years. Could you elaborate shortly? That my personal view has changed over time? Um, yeah, whether good reasons uh, for waging war exist has, have changed. Uh, okay. Well, uh, uh, well, from a personal point of view, uh, I, you know, and I'd al I've always been fascinated uh, by war, and 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 still am fascinated uh, by it. Uh, and I uh, started off, you know, but I've been uh, studying it, thinking about it in one way or, uh, or an another for thirty-five years, and um, that, that's a lot of wars that. Uh, were, have proved not to be useful, <laughs> you know, fun, fundamentally. We, we started, the whole time that I have been in, involved in the academic study of, uh, of war, in the formal academic study of war, I'm not sitting in my, my room reading, uh, you know, war books uh, as an individual, uh, has been post-Cold War. And during that period, there has been a relentless search for a sort of war that is decisive and cheap and easy, and of course it's never materialized. What, has, what, has, what have we had instead? It is wars that are protracted, that are thankless, that are invertebrate. And uh, so it's just been my personal experience that, you know, wars hasn't been, or anyway, it, it hasn't been good for very much. We've really struggled. Uh, we have really struggled to make war uh, useful. 
and the reasons for that are, 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 are complicated. Uh, it may relate to, you know, I think a lot of it relates to our, our society, the way we re regard war. It's not useful for, put it this way, if you, if, if you're, you have a society that does not believe in the utility of war, and you are fighting an, an, an enemy that does believe in the utility of it, then you're rather compromised in, in, your, in your ability to prosecute that war. That belief in the utility of war can make up for a big material Im imbalance. Anyway, to make a long story short, I've been studying war for a long time. We, none of them have been um, very successful. Most of them have been disastrous, uh, very expensive, in, literally, uh, you know, in terms of uh, money. Many thousands of lives lost. Uh, many tens and tens of thousands with life-changing injuries. You know, how many people in, in Germany, I, mean, Germ I, I, I don't know German casualty figures in Afghanistan, but, you know, I know in, in Britain there are 10,000 people going around mm. with uh, let fewer limbs yeah. than they ought to have because of decisions made, uh, right? And hundreds of billions of pounds spent that have not made the situation in Afghanistan better and have not made the international security, the environment better. Uh, you know, fighting the war on terror, like most, seems to have promoted terror. Um, so anyway, uh, short answer is experience. That's made me feel that it's, you know, less, less useful. Although I still obviously find it very, very interesting. So 35 years of um, academic experience and study sort of do come together with a pop song out of Detroit uh, in 1969 by The Temptations and Edwin Starr. Uh, just to end this and take it back actually to the notion of digital warfare, I'm trying to put two questions in one. You should never do that, but I'm trying it uh, right now. There's two things, for many things I do not understand about this war, but there's two things that really amaze me uh, at this stage. We've talked about this a little bit when we, when we uh, video zoomed in preparation for this evening. One is that we haven't seen broader, heavier cyber attacks on the West from the Russian side. The other is that info is so low on this war. I mean, there's all those mobile devices, there's all this connectivity, there's Starlink satellites going over the Ukraine, and the real images, the moving images, the overall reporting uh, from the front lines is very bad uh, compared, or very low, so to speak, compared to other conflicts. So no major cyber attacks uh, from Russia. I mean, there have been some, people have been reporting on it, but nothing major, right? And very low reporting from the front lines. Two things where digital warfare actually would come into play that haven't come into play yet. What's your explanation? Uh, okay, so firstly, why no, uh, why no cyber? Uh, two sides to that. The first is, as I said in the lecture, uh, Russia, it, f for purposes of affecting Ukraine, the Ukrainian in energy system or a transportation system or what have you, Russia has much more direct physical means available to it to accomplish those things that are more straightforward, more effective, cheaper, and so on. So that, I think, is one part of the answer. The second is, I presume that Russia does have certain significant cyber capabilities. It has the it. it I, I would be surprised if a, a country with Russia's uh, Russia's experience and its uh, um, uh, attitude towards preparation hadn't invested like other countries, Britain, the United States, plenty of others have invested in offensive cyber capability. I'd be, so I, w I think that Russia does have certain cyber, cyber capabilities and it has not deployed them yet because, um, it doesn't, because it doesn't, it wants to keep its powder dry. There is, at the moment, there is a distinctive, there is a distinctive possibility of escalation from a proxy war with NATO, which is what Russia is in now, to a direct war. That is when you would want, if you had something, if you had something really powerful in, in those terms, that's when you would want to uh, deploy it. It's in the, you know, so that I think is my best ex explanation. Save it for explanation, for why, basically. Why, why mm -hmm. less, no. less cyber than, than other. The other was uh, about the information coming, yeah. out of the, uh, coming out of the war. 
I think that the best thing that people can do to improve their understanding of this war and other wars is turn off the media. I'm sorry to journalists or media people in the room, but it's uh, just turn it off. There are other channels available to you. And, uh, and um, what channels? I will mention specifically. Okay. Uh, I have not, and you'll either leave this room thinking, my God, why did I listen to that guy? Or uh, think that this is a terrific idea. But I have not followed the media account of, of this war from the beginning. Of course, like I live in the same media environment as everyone else, and I can't help but, uh, you know, read the odd thing. But I'm not learning about what's happening out of, out of the media, certainly not off the, off the BBC or the, or, or the like. When the war began, I, uh, be, I uh, joined Telegram, and I subscribed to four accounts, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense and the Russian Ministry of Defense, and a pro-Ukrainian um, quasi-independent in, in, account and a pro-Russian quasi-independent uh, account. And I've simply watched those four accounts uh, obsessively throughout the war. Uh, there's no lack of imagery and video coming out. You can view tons of it. I, at this point, I, I, a ridiculously large number of hours looking at top-down, uh, you know, video of, of, of this. But it's all, it's all a perspective, right? It's all from it's all some propaganda. Sort of slant. And you have to, and so, you know, to the to the best of your ability. You have to take information from a range of sources, a binary conflict, looking at those, at those channels, seemed to me uh, a, a, a reasonable uh, choice of range of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of sources, and follow them consistently, and use your critical faculties. You know, you've, you've got one saying one thing, you've got another saying something else, you've got partial imagery, that's, that's the best you can do, but unfortunately I would not, you know, I, I, I say this uh, with, with uh, uh, conviction that you need to disconnect from the media. Why? Uh, because it's, uh, it's the least valuable form of information. It's coming to you, uh, it's coming to you uh, processed in a way that is that is not evident how it has been pro processed. If I'm going to eat a cake, I want to know how it's been baked. Okay. Uh, Telegram is not processed by the foreign ministry of I, the. I'm, I'm sure if you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, huh. of, of of course. All all those are perspectives, huh. right? Those are those are, international those are, those are accounts? Those are four different perspectives: right. two competing official perspectives and two competing partisan perspectives. Yeah. Just accept that, that, that each of, that all of those have, that all of those have a perspective. Be, it would be ridiculous to form your views of the war on the basis of what the Russian Ministry of Defense sure. said alone. Sure. Um, I think it's equally, uh, but I think it's also problematic to form an image uh, of, of the war that does not incorporate what is coming out of the Russian Ministry of Defense alongside other, al alongside other things. And you don't need you don't need uh, the the media to do that. You definitely don't need. Yeah, I wouldn't go further. Than that. Are those international accounts? Just to uh, I mean, are they English speaking? Some of them, or are they all Russian or and Ukrainian? So there are, have to... there are uh, so those are I, I am following them both in their English versions, but okay. they they both so you you can follow the Russian accounts and uh, so the Russian Ministry of Defense. Has, a, has an English language telegram yeah. channel. The Ukrainian Ministry of Defense has an English language telegram channel for obvious reasons, because that's the, that's the language of the major international sure. audience which they're trying to, uh, trying to speak to. There are, uh, what I haven't done is subscribe to the Russian uh, language Ministry of Defense uh, channel, and that's frankly because my Russian is too rusty uh, to cope with the volume of, uh, of, of Russian reading uh, that that requires. Uh, 
but so all of those are are, are Engl English accounts. available in English also. Okay, yeah. yeah. Have to expand my family chat and incorporate other Telegram channels apparently in uh, to my mobile phone. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you so much uh, for this lecture once again, uh, David Betts. Um, we're going to see each other again. For those of you who want to, we're going to continue this series on the sixth of October in Frankfurt with um, Stefania Milan on the Datafied uh, Society uh, subject we've been covered before, but from a different perspective now in October. Thank you very much for coming to us from all the way from London. David Betts, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us.